Praise the Lord. It, oh, it, I was thinking, well, I'll tell you, was that a good Christmas song, Rattle? Is that? A, <laughs> listen, I'm telling you, I like that song. It makes my bones want to raise up and do something for Jesus. Amen? I'm telling you, we'll share that video on our app. We've had some glitches in our system, but that's okay. I don't know what life would be like if we didn't have a few glitches. Amen? But, uh, but I am excited. That song, I know it's not, you know, Emmanuel and it's not Silent Night. But, man, I think every once in a while we ought to be excited about serving Jesus. Amen? I think we got enough mumbling out there. We need to be excited and... That just excited me. I have nothing else. That done, I feel like I've done ran a lap or two. Amen. It done me. I, you're helping my health by singing that song, Randy. I'm telling you. I like it. But if you have your Bible with you, turn with me to Genesis chapter 12, uh, 5 through 9. And uh, Genesis chapter 12, 5 through 9. Uh, if you're able to, uh, one last time. I know you guys like to stand, and if you would stand and honor the reading of the Word of God, uh, I'll read just, I, I said 12 or, or 5, and, and then I, 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 that's where I'll start. Boy, I'll tell you what, I'm bound up. I, I found more here, but I can't, I can't pack it in. I might have to save it for later. I'm excited. But, but Genesis chapter 12, verse 5, the Bible says, And Abraham, Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot's brother's son, and their substance, and they had gathered in all the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared to him. And he removed thence unto a mountain, circle in your Bible a mountain, on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Hai hey, is the same as Ai. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed, going still toward the south. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, I've read from your heavenly library, God, and I thank you, God, for those that are here excited for this Christmas season of giving, but God, also excited to worship a risen Savior. God, we can worship you in the manger. God, we can worship you on the cross. We can worship you, your risen, because God, you are the God of all things. God, and I thank you for your goodness. I pray today, maybe somebody would be here that doesn't know you, and God, they would walk out of here and have a relationship with you. That's my heart's desire. God, have your way in this service today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. As I looked into the scripture, and, and, and we've, we've been talking about Emmanuel, God with us. Many of you know, as I said before, if you take the word Emmanuel, some people spell it with an I, some people spell it with an E. And if you look at the true from the Hebrew directly into English, it would be spelled with an I, which is the way I've spelled it on a lot of things. But if you look in the Greek and the New Testament, you transfer that into Hebrew and then to English in the translation, it changes one letter, which becomes E. And if you look at the last part of Emmanuel, the E L is God, and then the I I M or E M is us, and the middle is with. So it's God with us, Emmanuel. And in this sermon series last week, I preached on the God of the Valley. But this week, I want to preach on the God of the mountain, the God of the mountain. So it's God with us. Aren't you glad that he meets us on the mountaintops? Uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. You've had a mountaintop week and a mountaintop year. Uh, if I want to hit the rewind button, we can go back to a year called 2020. Some of us, we might not have the best life right now, but it's a better year than 2020. Amen? I mean, when they was locking down churches and, and they was closing things, and man, we was all afraid that, man, we, we was going to get a parasite that was going to eat us down to the bone. I mean, we was worried. Amen? Some of you wasn't so worried, but others I know are still locked down, amen? It was a difficult time, but what it crippled our economy, a lot of our economy now is that, is that we are, hey, guys, you can stay a while. I promise it'll get better. It's okay. You guys look at me. It, it just, it'll get better. Okay, you come in the back when you sit down and you come back, please. But, but as, I, as I look at the economy and look at our, our world today, man, I mean, we've had some mountaintop experiences, amen? We've had some opportunity, and really, whenever I think about Abram, and, and he's going down through Shechem, and, and, and if you look at your, on the, on the app, I'm trying this out, but on the app, there's sermon notes, and it should be available. If they don't pull up, I've posted it wrong, but we're working on this. But I put a map of Abram's travel, and if you want to, refer to that later in our app. But there is a map, and Abram went from your uh, you are all the way up to the top down through Mesopotamia and then down through kind of the Golan Heights area. So you're talking about a travel of over 1,400 miles that Abram made. 
And, and in just a few verses, it, you know, we think, well, God called Abraham over here and he goes over there and he goes over there. Well, there was a lot of living between where God called him and where he went to this mountaintop, the first mountaintop. And then if you look at the rest, then he goes down another four or 500 miles down into Egypt only to come back to Mount Moriah. And then uh, the Bible says that, that God said, offer up your own son Isaac. I mean, there was a lot of traveling, but, but just in a few verses it says God called Abram from Ur and he went up down to Shechem and went down there. And you're really talking about a year's time probably of travel because he had a lot of people with him. So when God called Abram to this mountain, I, I don't know about you, but I, I don't mind going on vacation but I like to look up on Google what it's going to be like. Now, some of you may not have this on your schedule, but I understand that it's not a hot spot to want to travel. It's called Baghdad. Now, if you want a place that's high risk, from my understanding, it's one of the least traveled places in the world, and you can figure that out in Iraq. And, and so, I mean, but if I'm going to go to Baghdad, I'm going to look up and Yelp's going to tell me it's a one star. I'm like, I'm not going to Baghdad. Amen. And but, but Abram didn't have that. He didn't have Google. And, and so he's going to a place that's unknown to him. And, and God's called him to this place. And, and I thought it was awesome that, that Abram and Lot and his family, they go to this place and God calls him to the top of this mountain. And he calls him to this mountain region. The first time we see the word mountain in your Bible is when Abram's called to this place, which is why I chose the scripture. But Abram goes to the top of this mountain and God says to him, basically, he says, I'll bless them that bless you in verse 1. I'll curse them that curse you. And he said, I'll be with you and I'm going to give you all this land. Now, that sounds interesting to us. And I don't know about you. I want to have a whole lot of land, but I don't really want to pay for it. And I don't really want to pay the taxes. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I mean, you look, you look, and then I, especially in the wrong community, I don't want to be paying the special taxes. Some of you know what that's like. I mean, them, them houses, they, they, the prices get down, but the taxes seem to go the other direction. So, and listen, Abram's in this place, and he raised him up, and he's thinking, you know what? I've kind of got to fend for my family and fend for myself. And if you're not careful, when we see the word land, we'll just think of money. But land in the Bible time was much more than that to the Israelite people. Land meant that it was that Abram, when God told Abram, he said, I'm going to give you this land. As far as you can see and as far as you can travel, that's what Abram's travel was all about is he was going to see his territory that God had given him. And he said, Abram, he said, I want to give you this land. I want to be able to bless you and take care of you. Really, God wasn't telling Abram, I'm going to make your pocketbook thick. He said, but I'm going to give you the ability to fend for yourself and your family. Let me park here for a second. If you're a man, your obligation is to take care of your family and fend for your family. I understand sometimes people can't work. I understand sometimes people are disabled. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you are the man of the home. You need to take your responsibility and you'll stand before God someday and give an account that you're not or you will or you won't take care of your family. Now that wasn't in my notes. That was free. Somebody say amen. I'll, make, I'll move on. But I mean this, Abram standing there, and so one of his big things is that Abram then stands at the top of this mountain, and so God's not saying, Abram, I'm going to make your pocketbook thick, but what God's telling Abram is, he's saying, Abram, I'm going to give you a source that'll be uh, in, uh, the utmost important to take care of your family. You see, they had to have crops, they had to have corn, they had to have wheat, whatever he was going to grow. They had to have uh, fruits, whatever it was. There is some places down there, those mountainous regions that don't grow as much on the top. You've heard the sermons. But he's looking over the top of these valleys, and he's not telling him, I'm just going to give you money, but he's telling him, Abram, I haven't brought you all the way out here to leave you by yourself, but I brought you all the way out here to show you that I'm going to take care of you. Somebody in 2020 needs to hear that God is our source and that he wants to take care of us and he wants to bless us not just in our pocketbook but he wants to bless us. Some of us are to be thankful that we have a house over the top of that we have a roof over our head and that we have shoes on our feet and man I'm telling you the old saints of God used to sing that you know I got a roof and I got table food on my table man we're blessing than 90 more blessed than 90 percent of the whole wide world if we have those two things. And he's saying to Abram, he's saying, look, Abram, I'm going to give you all this stuff so I can see Abram after this roughly, we don't know how long, but year's journey. Abram's like, man, thank you, God. And here's what he did. He built an altar. Man, see, that's, if you're not careful, you get lost up in the, and I know some churches don't do this anymore. We do. We, have, we believe in altars, and, and we have altars, and I know some churches get so big, they can't ask them to come. There'd be too many. I mean, they couldn't meet all the needs of the people, but we're still a small church, so we can do it. But my point is, is, is sometimes we get, we get taught, we need an altar, we need an altar, we need this, we need that, and I agree with that. Man, I mean, that's why we got one. 
but we miss the whole point of an altar. Because really, we think, the Bible says that we're to, I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercy of God, that present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is reasonable service. So when he does this, Abram's saying, I'm presenting myself to you. I'm presenting my substance. Before God ever really showed him what the gland was going to, before the first piece of wheat come off that wheat, God says, I'm going to give to you out of what I have. And he, and, but, but more than anything, he offers himself to him. But what he does is in, the Bible says that God appeared to him. Man, I'm telling you what an altar is. It's just a meeting place for you and God. I don't know about you, but in 2022, man, I'm going to say that. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to be, start practicing 2023. Some of you are going to write checks wrong. You may still write checks in here. Yeah, you'll write them wrong for another year, but don't worry about it. It'll change again. But, and I've done that. But especially when I wrote more checks, I don't know what day it is. And sometimes the year... But I'm telling you, in 2022 and 2023, if we need anything, we need a place that we consecrate, not just in a church, but maybe in your house, maybe in your prayer closet. We need a meeting place for God. We need a place that we really get alone with God and say, and maybe get two or three people with God and, and get to a place where we say, you know what, I'm going to sanctify this place in my home or this place because I'm telling you, if God don't show up, we're in trouble. Audrey, aren't we in trouble if God don't show up? Man, when we have anything we do here, our anticipation and our idea is that we have a meeting place with God. And, and I don't want to have a service and we don't hope that God shows up in the midst of it. And Abram knew what this principle was. So God says to him, he says, it's your source. It's your place. We're on top of this mountain, man, and, and, and the rest of his family. And they'd gone to a place that God wasn't just going to show him that he was going to bless him, but that God would show up and meet with them. But whenever God spoke to Abraham, he would be looking out over these cities of Bet Shan and where, where Saul and his sons, sons years later were hung. And the Bet Shan means the house of rest. And Shechem, he'd be looking over Shechem. Abraham's up on top of this mountain. And Shechem means diligence. He said, you know what? God will give us diligence. You know what that means? That means we can be a steward. We can be diligent. You know what we need in churches today? We need men and women to stand up and be diligent for the things and be intentional. Hey, you may ever listen to that guy about it being intentional. You ever listen to that guy on the radio? He's not as popular anymore. But man, I'm telling you, years ago, he used to be on, top, on, on Bot Radio Network. Anybody listen to Bot Radio? Yeah. We had a commercial on there. We had someone show up at our church because Tony hooked us up with somebody. We got a commercial on there. And someone said, I heard you on Bot Radio Network. But they used to say, be intentional. Man, wake up in the morning, be intentional. And, and so when Abraham's looking over these cities, he's looking at Bet Chan, the house of rest and Shechem diligence. And he's looking over Mora, which is teacher. He's looking over Bethel, which is the house of bread, where all this is going to be. So God's saying, I'm not just going to give you land. I'm going to give you meaning of what the land is. And man, that excites Abraham so much. Then God shows up and meets with him. But you know what? When you're talking about mountains and building altars, one of the things I think about mountains is, is you must be willing to climb. You must be willing to climb. You know, and, and, and I know, man, we've got a great church with great people. So this is for other churches. No, just as a joke. It wasn't funny, but it's a joke. But, but, I, but I mean this. We have to have a willing heart. But you know what he says? He says, God, let thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. There's a willingness about this mountain climbing. Everybody wants to live on top of a mountain. But when you get there, what are you going to do when you get there? Because you have to be willing with a willing heart. God, not my will, but thy will be done. I'm talking about the mountain experience that is above these daily battles of just hitting our head against the wall and struggling with the same sin and struggling with the same problem. I know we're going to struggle with sin, but we shouldn't be struggling with the same sins. There are to be, you know what I learned? I thought, man, if I ever get alcohol behind me, then I'll, then I'll be doing good. Then I learned, well, God delivered me from that. Now I got another issue. Amen. So you know what I'm talking about. And that's where people give up. Man, if I ever get this behind me, then, 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 I'll, then I realize there's just another issue. But you know what? Whenever I've moved on, I think it's nice to look back and say, you know what? It's been 18 years and my lips haven't touched alcohol. I haven't had to stop at the dope house. My family's different. My life is different. It is different. 
It is different. There was a place when I prayed and I struggled and I thought, God, would you ever take this urge from me? Some of you have been delivered instantly. That wasn't how it was for me. I was delivered like through a process, man. I mean, God put me down. I was in a blender, it felt like. Man, it, it hurt me. I was like, I know my spirit was willing, but my flesh was weak, the Bible says. And man, but there ought to be some mountaintop experience where you say, you know what? And I'm telling you, I've seen it in some of your lives that there's some things you used to battle, Jay, that you don't battle anymore. Anymore. There's some things, Kendra, you battle that you don't battle anymore. You still have a program and you still have your God and you still have maintenance, but you're not doing it because you're afraid of doing it. You're doing it because you want to have maintenance to be sure you don't end up there someday. Today, they're in the house of God. I don't want to, they're, they're not nursing a hangover this morning. They've made a decision to be delivered and have a mountaintop experience. Hey, some of us ain't got enough years left. We are to go ahead and enjoy God and a little bit better of life on a mountaintop every once in a while. There ain't, hey, you can be spiritual if you want to. Oh, Brother Jason, everything grows better in the valley. You can have your valley. <laughs> Woo, I mean it. You, I'm feeling that. I, I don't mind the valley every once in a while, but I don't want to waller in the valley. I want to get a little bit higher than I would. Man, I don't, I've been in the valley in the mud and the mire. The man, Jeremiah said that he was in a mire. They threw old Jeremiah down the pit and he sunk, man, up to his chest and they threw in some rags and bailed him out. You can be down in the mud and the mire if you want to, but I'm going to be on the mountaintop every once in a while. Amen. And I don't think there's nothing wrong with God. Give us a willing heart and a willing mind to be able to live above my circumstances. Oh, there's nothing wrong. Listen, we're still trying to figure out. You think you're crazy. We're still trying to figure out sometimes how to pay that $2,000 electric bill, man, in the summertime. But I'm sure glad it's winter. It's lowered about 600 bucks. Man, I'm telling you, I understand. Lord, man, let them. Let, I, we, we like it cool in there, but maybe we should try to open the windows up. Man, now they've nailed them shut. Amen. To keep, to, because it, it, hel it helps with the, with the air, man. I mean, we're, I mean, I understand living in faith, but man, Sometimes it's more about keeping the air conditioner and the heat on, man. Sometimes it's about being, being the Bible says that, that only, man, that God is our joy. God is our strength. He's our ever-present help in time of trouble. Man, that he says, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, that I wish that I could gather you under your wings as, as a mother hen does its chicks, man. That don't mean God's a chicken. Some of you might not know that, but that's not literal. But what he's saying is he's saying, hey, come out from that valley and get underneath these wings. And man, I'm telling you, if I want to be anyway, I want to be underneath the wings of God. Amen. I want to be living above. And what? Hey, listen, I'm telling you, I've heard this said too. Some of us got to be careful. We want to run with eagles, but you want to fly with eagles, but you got to quit hanging out with chickens. That's spiritual. Some of you will get that by the time. We, that's not in the notes. But I'm telling you, I mean it. Some of us, man, it's time that we get with the eagles and get a mountaintop experience, man, and say, you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore. You know what? I'm not going to live that way anymore. You know what? I'm not going to let that person in my house. I'm talking about turning to God and saying, you know what? I'm not going to be that anymore. And that's what Abraham was really doing. Abraham, where he was from, there was over 500 deities and gods. He would have never found the true God where he was. He would have been impacted by his family, but God's taken him here. But when I talk about mountains, you have to prepare. That's in the fill in the blank on our notes, I believe. You have to prepare to climb a mountain. We went one time to our, to our house, and, or to our house. We went one time to, uh, on a trip, and, and me and the boys, they were to Tennessee, the Smoky Mountains, amen? These mountains in Israel aren't that big, but they're pretty good-sized mountains. They're bigger than anything we got in Kansas. But, but we went to the Smoky Mountains, and we went on a hiking trip. And the boys were like, I'm going all the way up, Dad. I'm going all the way up. And I'm like, uh, good luck, you know. I, they looked at me, I'm, I'm not going. I wasn't ready. I knew I wasn't ready. I'm not ready today. Now in 2024, if that gym membership works out and I get back in there, I might be ready, amen? I mean, I'm paying for it. If I start using it, I might be more ready. But I'm like, I'm not ready. So, so I get on, I, I, man, I start up this mountain and we start up this trail and it's real good for the first half mile. And then all of a sudden, the back of your legs start burning, your calves start burning, and your feet start hurting. And they're like, Dad, we're going on to the top. I said, well, come back down because we ain't coming up to get you. I'm going to be clear. So I got about, I don't know how far I got up. I want to say about six miles, but it was probably about a mile and a half, two miles. And, man, I walked up there, and I said, you know, if I'm, I got to, okay, it's one thing coming up, but then you got to get back down. And my legs was like jello. I'm talking about mountain climbing. 
And so I was like, they found the, the grandpa's seat, you know. That's in little places on the edge, that you, the path, and you just watch. Hi, how you doing? They go by. They're going on. You know, you know some of them hikers. You know what I'm talking about. They're dressed for it. I mean, they're out there. They're looking like Richard Simmons, you know. You know, some date me, ain't I? You know what I'm talking about. You know, they got their headband on, their shorts on. They're ready. I'm like, dude, it's like 40 here. Well, they're, 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 they're serious. I mean, they, they got pantyhose on. I mean, that's to keep them warm, you know, looking weird. But they're hiking, and they're going to make it to the top. Well, this old dad wasn't. I, I wore my loafers, you know. You don't ever wear them loafers, do you, Joe? I like them loafers, man. Just slip them on. You don't have time. You don't have to bend over to time. Man, I'm finally getting up there, and them boys said, we're going on. And I said, be careful. I mean, it, it, it's, it's hard. They go, we can do it. And all of a sudden, we waited about an hour. Waited about an hour and a half. We're like, man, what am I going to do? So one of them hung back with us. I said, go get your brothers. They're like, what? I said, I'm not going. They said, I'm not either. I said, yes, you are. Because you'll never see your brothers again because I'm leaving. And so they went on up that mountain. And I'm telling you, he come, they come back. And them boys that was so eager to climb that mountain, they come back. And Joshua, he's the big boy. You know, he's bigger than me. He's six, like 6'4". Six, and I'm not going to tell you his weight, but he's a lot bigger than me. And he was bigger than me then, taller than me then. And he come walking down. And, man, he don't look the same. He went up one child. And he walked down another, you know. He, he's, his eyes, I mean, I mean, they're glassed over. And man, he's tired. And he, his legs is giving one of these, you know. I'm serious. I can't exaggerate it enough. And I really thought, we're going to have to call Samuel to come get this boy. He said, my legs, my feet, my back. I'm telling you. I said, I told you. You see, they wasn't prepared. Sometimes we want to be on the mountaintop, but we've got to prepare ourselves. And that's what I remember is Ephesians chapter 6. And I won't be long here. But I think about having the helmet of salvation. I think about having the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. And man, that's mountain climbing gear. I almost brought my work boots, but I forgot them last night and forgot them today. I, I, I forgot my phone, by the way. Pray for me. I don't know what's wrong with me. I've been, <laughs> been, been working on stuff late. But man, I'm telling you, I got work boots. And, and they're, they're for going out in the oil field. They're going, for going out in the cow pasture. They're for working down the church. You got work boots. You ain't wearing them flip-flops doing what you're doing. I can tell you that. But I'm telling you this right now is I got work boots, and I know if I'm going out in the mud, I'm going to put them on. But if I'm mountain climbing, I'm not wearing slippers either. The little bit that I'm going to do, I'm going to get my most comfortable shoes, but the Bible says that we're supposed to have the shoes of peace. That's what will help you. You cannot mountain climb if you don't find peace in your life. Peace on earth, goodwill to all men. And then not only that, we have to have the shield of faith. Man, that's what, that's what it distinguishes the dark to the, the, the enemy of the evil one. Sometimes the devil tells us, you know, we're not going to make it up the mountain. Sometimes the devil tells us, you know, you just ought to stay down in the valley. You know, you're just not worth it. Listen, I put up my shield of faith and say, no, I'm not worth it, but I know a God that's worth it. I know a God that the God of heaven smiled upon and said, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. My faith is not in me, but my faith is in the son that died on a cross for my sins. My faith is not in the work that I do. I do repent and do my best, but even then my righteousness is filthy rags. But I pick up the shield of faith and not only the shield of faith, but I also take the helmet of salvation. And man, we got to put the helmet of salvation on because you're going to knock your head if you go to climbing mountains. That's what, that's what Henry would say, knocking heads. He'd say, Henry would say, Papa, would you knock me in the head? <laughs> I'd knock him in the head. Then i rub his head like this. He likes it. He does. He, you can't do it too hard. That boy, I think I'm going to hurt you. He goes, knock on my head, Papa, knock on my head. So that's where I get that knock on my head from. But you're going to get your head knocked on a mountain or two. You're going to be walking up a mountain. And you're going to think, man, I'm doing good. Th I'm talking about someone that wants to grow spiritually. I'm talking about someone that wants to come up out of their circumstance. I'm talking about someone that wants to quit battling the same old thing they've been battling. And I'm telling you, you'll do real good for a while, but you better have that helmet of salvation because you fall on that mountain path, you're going to get hurt. And I'm telling you, when I fall, I say, God, thank you for my salvation. Thank you for proving me your love that you have for me. Man, I thank God. Thank you. Thank you for being my source. Thank you for being everything that pertains to life and godliness was all wrapped up in that little manger, that baby called Jesus. Everything, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, that gave his life for all was wrapped up. All my salvation, God, you fit into a little box. I believe it was a little concrete stable, and, and, you, and you put that little baby in there, and that was everything I ever needed. God, you, you didn't get me all the way up the half of the mountain and then say, you know what? You don't have enough. 
Man, he's got everything you need that pertains to life, the Bible says, in godliness. Everything we need for a mountain journey. But man, we got to have mountain eyes that looks up and says, my redemption draweth nigh. I'm telling you, as I begin to think about this, one thing I never got is, you know, you have to be willing, you have to prepare. But one thing I never realized about the mountain is when he took old Abram up there, he took him up there and when he's looking out across that, here's the part I didn't, here's the part I didn't get. The Bible says this in the last verse I read. It says that he journeyed, he journeyed on. He journeyed on. See, some of us have met with God one time and we walk back down the mountain and we continue to live our life the same way we're living it. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. I was that guy. I was that guy that I'd get in trouble and I'd say, oh God, help me out of this one. Oh God, I need this. Oh God, I need that. And man, only to find out, man, when I was foot loose and fancy free again, I left God right back there on that mountaintop again. Oh God, none of you's ever done that, but I did it for years and Man, I never really had a true salvation. And when I walked into a church, I realized, oh my goodness, if I would have fell and died in that state, then I would have split hell wide open. That means I wouldn't have made heaven my home in this life, but as if just a vapor here today and gone tomorrow, I would have spent an eternity where the worm dieth not. And man, when I realized that, it scared the Jesus into me. I mean to tell you, people say, well, you can't scare them into heaven. Well, let me tell you what. You can let them know that heaven is real and hell's real too. And when I realized that, but here's Abram, and he takes him up to this mountaintop, and when it said he journeyed on, here's the part I never got. When he said he journeyed toward the south, he journeyed on to the south where he was looking. He would have been looking across the plains as he walked down that mountain. He would have been heading toward Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the city of peace. It wasn't formed in that name yet, but there was another name. But as he walked down toward that city, he would have been heading toward Jerusalem. And the prophecy in the Bible and this divine appointment, you don't realize what God can do today if you're obedient and do what God wants you to do. You'll never know plan B. You'll never know plan A if you don't do what God wants you to do. And here's Abraham, and as he went down over the top of that mountain, he's walking down past Jerusalem. And, man, that gets exciting because some of us need some peace in our life, don't we? We need to have shoes of peace, but we need to have a city of peace. I got cities of peace. I got The other day, it was a busy day. And, man, I'm not complaining at all, but it was one of those days. And I said, I'm getting ready to go in and eat. And I thought, let me grab my phone. I thought, wait a minute, never mind. I threw that phone. I shut the door and went in there and ate. I just needed a few minutes with God. I needed just a few minutes, man. On the tits is funny, maybe, but you know, you know what? I, I was sitting there, and you know, I'm like, oh, I got it. No, I can't check that on my phone. Oh, I got it. No, I can't do that. I can't do that on my phone. I forgot. I didn't bring my phone today. Maybe it's a good discipline on Sunday morning. I forgot it, but I'm telling you, I sit there, and, and I was sitting there talking to that waitress and looking at those people, and God began to move in me, and just some digress time, some peaceful time, and I looked up, and this is hilarious. I don't care nothing about it, but they, do you know that they have a game that they got dogs that catch frisbees? I, that's it's awesome i'd never seen it before but there's nothing else to do you know besides sit there and talk to god a little bit in my mind the bible says pray without ceasing so i'm always talking to god and and as, you know i call them flash prayers god be with us today god be with Andrew down the hospital day man i'll say god be with this person and that but i saw that and man, i just found a little place of peace down there but see that wasn't really the the point of abram's journey because south of jerusalem i've been there now you go through a city gate and, and it's held by guards and they got guns and, and the Jewish people aren't allowed to be in there because it's under Palestinian authority. It looks like a prison today. That's what it looks like. South of Jerusalem, you drive just a little mile, maybe 15 miles. It's kind of connected like Wichita and Hayesville, so it's hard to tell for sure. But I've been on that trip and, and I went down through there and when you do, they said, our, our tour bus said, Jason, they said, you need to, you need to get, go, or excuse me, I need to go. And so there's going to be someone on the other side of the gate that's going to meet you. I'm like, this don't feel right. You know what I'm saying? I'm in, I'm in Israel. I'm in Jerusalem. And they're like, we get to this gate. And they're like, we're going to get off the bus and someone will meet you at the gift shop. I'm like, this is, they're going to take us. <laughs> I mean, really, this is creepy. I mean, they got guns. We don't have guns. And, and they, these, you know, they're, they're, you can tell they're different and the city's different. And then they hear the Muslim prayers come over there. Ay, 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 how they do. I mean, it's creepy. It'll make the chills run up and down your spine. And I'm like, Okay, you know, me and this bus, you know. And so we get in there and we pull down through there. And I said, where are we going? They said, today you're going into Bethlehem. See, 
It may be under Palestinian authority today, but Bethlehem is that place that that baby was born. And when you go to the manger, you go to the places, to the manger of the church, it's a single file line. And it's interesting because when you go down to Bethlehem now, they have a little star that's down in the ground where that place they believe that Jesus was born. And it's interesting because of all the things you have to do in Bethlehem, you have to kneel down. Because the door's not tall enough. It's just about this tall. And I thought, oh, how proper that this place this baby was born. We got to kneel. So it doesn't, there were some people that were there. They didn't really believe in Jesus like we believe. They were just on what they call the footsteps tour of Jesus because they wanted to know the history of Jesus. But even those people that didn't believe, before you go down, you have to kneel down and you have to lower yourself. And man, I'm telling you, when Abram walked past and God's saying, I'm going to give you this land, he wasn't saying, Abram, I'm going to give you money. He said, and Abram, I'm going to give you the source of all things. That's the part I never got, Flint. That's what you got. That's what gets you to doing ministry and work with people and calling people. That's what it does is you got the source right. Man, we can do good things, but the source of my life comes from this little child and this manger that was born and this God that died on a cross for my sin. And then I was going and I was thinking of an illustration. Last night I, I left my house and I was leaving. And, and I, I missed my turn. Right by our house is a turnpike. And I don't know why I do it, but I get in my truck, and it's like I'm an autopilot for the first three miles. Anybody else do that? If they've lived out, you're like, okay, I'm in the car. And I'm like, darn it, I missed my turn. I was going to see Andrew. Andrew, you know, has had trouble, and he's had just had a quadruple bypass. It's on the prayer chain, so it's okay for me to mention. Sometimes I don't mention it because people are private. But that's Dana's husband. And, 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 he, and he's been in the hospital, and, and he just had heart surgery less than 24 hours before, or right at a little more than 24 hours, about 32 hours since his surgery. And whenever I seen him the last time he was going in, thought he was going to have a triple bypass. And as I walked in, I saw Andrew sitting there and he looked different. His face was lit up. He was red. He was alert. Man, he, he, he it looked different. You know, when they fix your heart, people look different. You know what? When Jesus fixes your heart, you look different. And I'm telling you, but the doctors and through God had fixed his heart. And I went and I said, Andrew, I missed my turn. He goes, my wife and daughter left it. They come to church last night. Said they're missing. They're, what are you doing here? They're at church. I said, well, I'm running late, but I want to come and pray with you. And I said, I want to pray for you. And he, he grabbed my hand. And it touched me. But I'll tell you what, some things in life will touch you. And he grabbed my hand and he said, no, I'm going to pray for you. Had a quadruple bypass. His life's in the balance. They say the first 48 hours is the most important. You keep praying for him, church. But when that man said that to me, he grabbed my hand. He prayed for me. It made tears come to my eye. And, of course, I prayed for him. And I scurried out the church so I could make it on time to get to church last night. And I got in my car, and I started driving down the road, and God spoke to me. He said, and I thought, God, that man, he's different. He's changing. I, you know what? And God spoke to me. He found the source. He found the source. When you're flat on your back and your life backs against the wall, I promise you, you just will find the source today because Jesus is our source. He's not only the greatest gift of the holiday season, but he is the source of life. I want to say to you today, have you found the source? Have you been willing to climb and have you prepared to climb? Because I'm telling you, there's a mountaintop adventure ahead of us. Every head bowed, every eye closed. As they come to sing, I want to ask you this question. Who in here would say that, you know, today's the day of salvation for me? Today's the day that I need to get out from where I am. And, and you know, sometimes church, it's called what I call the comfort zone. Abram had to move out from the comfort zone and, and move into what God wanted him to have. Sometimes it's, it's hard to make the journey because of what you have to leave behind. But I promise you, it is worth leaving behind anything that would so easily beset you or that would hold you back from serving God. And maybe someone here today would say, you know, this Christmas season of giving, I realize that God so loved the world that he gave, and I need to give my life to the source of all things. And today's my day of salvation. I won't come to you. I won't embarrass you. But I'm going to say a prayer. And if you want to be a part of this prayer, just slip up your hand and write back down. I'll pray for you. Who would lift their hand and say, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else that would say thank you? I want to be a part of this. I want to find the source. I want to be connected with a God. I want to meet with God on a mountaintop. I want God to help me. If that's you, slip up your hand and write back down. I'll pray for you. Amen. Amen. Several of them here. Maybe somebody here today would say that, you know, I've, 
I've just been in, a, in this holiday season. I recognize, church, that, that it's difficult. I recognize that it can be even stressful. And maybe somebody here needs to say, I need to find my peace again. I need to find the real true meaning of Christmas. Amen. I just need to find my peace. I need to find my place with God to meet with him. Thank you for those hands. Several of us need to just find our peace. And if you raise your hand, even if you didn't, if you, what I want you to do now is just stand up right where you are. Don't wait. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up all around the church. Stand up. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a meeting place with God down here in front of the church at this altar. If you just step out of your seat, Christian, slide back so they can get out. Be in the attitude of prayer. Why don't we just spend some time praying and asking God to meet with us this year, asking God to do a work in us. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the day of redemption, the Bible says.